This is an interview with former mayor of Birmingham, David Vann, for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project by Dr. Horace Huntley at Miles College, February 2nd, 1995 at 2.30 p.m. Mayor Vann, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule today to come out and talk with us. It's a pleasure. We want to just start today by just getting a little background. Like, who are you? <laughs> we know that you, uh, you've been around and you've been involved in, in really changing the whole concept of what Birmingham was about. But let me just ask you about your parents. Tell me a little about your, your mother and father. Where were they born? Were they Birminghamians? Well, my father was born on my great-grandfather's farm in the area you would now call Huffman. Most of Huffman was a part of my great-grandfather, Joel King Van's farm. And he was a uh, second generation in the county. His father brought him as a baby from North Carolina in 1822, settled in the Trustville area. My mother was from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She had a brother that was a mining engineer and came to Birmingham uh, with a cousin uh, and they started several businesses. Uh, but his wife died somewhere around 19, seven or eight. Uh -huh. And my mother and her mother came to Birmingham to look after the daughter and help her brother Walter. Uh, my mother was at, taught school in the Birmingham school system. She taught at Alderman, she taught at Park Lake. And at the time, my father, uh, my father graduated from the North Alabama Conference College, I believe in 1902. Uh, that was the second graduating class on that campus. That's my, Birmingham Southern now? Well, it is now. And my grandfather, Felix Van, was a, in the real estate business in Old Elerton. And family tradition is that he and a group of Elerton businessmen raised $6,000 and went to the Methodist Church and said they wanted to start a college at Owington, which was an unincorporated area north of Elerton. And the Owens family apparently donated some land on top of the hill. And they, the businessmen promised that if they'd start the college, they would have the first building ready within a year. And they had a big argument as to whether you should build a Christian college at a wicked, wicked place like Birmingham. At that time, there was a saloon on every corner downtown, about four breweries. Jack Daniel whiskey was distilled on Second Avenue, I think. And uh, there were brothels up and down the railroad track. Uh, and it was sort of like a wild west town still. Uh, but they said this is out in the country in the fresh air. And so they started, they opened in 97 as the North Alabama Conference College. They changed the name to Birmingham College about 1910. And then I think it was in 1918 the Methodist Church was faced with the problem of having two colleges and not many students because the young men had all gone, were going to war. And uh, they merged the two colleges and it became Birmingham Southern. And most of the history of Birmingham Southern, they talk about the history of Southern University, which started, I think, in 1842. But I've always thought they ought to put some emphasis in the North Alabama Conference College because if it hadn't been for the efforts of those gentlemen to get that college started, there wouldn't be a Birmingham Southern College here. Uh, my father stayed after graduation. They had everything from first grade through fourth year college. And so they had a, a grammar school and high school, and my father stayed as principal. Oh. And, and stayed there, I think, about till 1909, and then he went down to the university and got his law degree. I believe it was a two-year law program at those, in those years. Uh, 
And I believe I have his diploma on my wall. I believe it's dated 1911, or when. So then he practiced law here in Birmingham. No, he had a brother that had tuberculosis, and the doctor said he ought to go live in the mountains. My grandfather had become a Methodist minister after this business of starting the college, and that meant his children could go to the new college free. And it was the first generation of my family that got to have a college education. And I've always thought Grandpa was pretty smart to help start a college so his children get a college education. But uh, they moved the bishop, uh, gave my grandfather Felix uh, a church at Fruithurst, Alabama, in the mountains. And uh, Dad started his law practice in Heflin so he could be near his brother. Then later he moved to Roanoke, Alabama, and I was born in Roanoke, uh, which is the largest town in Randolph County, but Wedowie is the county seat. And uh, Dad was elected circuit solicitor, which was the district attorney in effect of that era. And then in 1931, I believe he was appointed circuit judge by Governor Miller. And he died in 1934, about a week before election. He was running for re-election. Uh, the house was full of campaign material. In June of, uh, it must have been 46, right at the end of the war, the war, the war had, was over as far as the fight was concerned, but it wasn't officially over. And I thought I'd be drafted in August when I'd become 18. And so a friend of mine, Said, well, let's just start in June. So we, we volunteered and joined the Army. Had to have my mother's permission because I was only 17. Uh, and I spent a year and a half in the Army in the, in the uh, uh, occupation of Korea. When the Japanese Army pulled out, the American Army went in and set up a military government until they could organize their own government. And uh, I was barely 18. They made me a criminal investigator because I had a year and a half of college. And I told him I was going to study law. And I joined in June. By October, I was in Korea, and I had a Jeep and a driver and a two-way radio and a Korean interpreter. This and was I, at the time when They put me out investigating cases. Hmm. This was at the time that uh, the military was just then being integrated. Isn't that well, correct? no, it wasn't. It was segregated. Okay. And uh, I spent a year there, and I qualified for the GI Bill, which assured me that I would be able to go to law school. And I didn't use my GI Bill until I got to law school. I came back to Alabama, mm -hmm. and I had a job. And I was the I was actually I was the technical director of the University Theater. I, as a as a high school student, I'd worked with the Auburn players and learned how to build scenery. And they could find plenty of people that liked to act, but not many people that wanted to use hammers and nails and paint. And, make the set. So I did that for two years, and then I went to Austin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got called to active duty in my senior year in law school, and I went back in the Army as a counterintelligence officer. And now it was an integrated Army in that three or four year period. And I had uh, black agents that worked for me. I had gotten a commission. Uh, well, and it was sort of interesting. They, they came from all over the country, but if they had personal problems, they always came to me. Somehow they trusted me as a Southerner better than they tr trusted those Yankee mm -hmm. boys. Mm -hmm. How different was the, the military uh, as a segregated institution then as it ended? Well, the segregated army that I was in, all the black soldiers were in trucking companies or uh, laundry companies or supply. Supply. Kind of I really seldom saw black soldiers. But you did have black investigators? When I went back in, in, in uh, 51, mm -hmm. I had b black counterintelligence agents that worked, for, worked under me. Yeah. Well, after you, when you uh, left the military the second time, what did you do? Well, I was about to finish my master's degree in law at George Washington. I, while I was in the Army, I went to the Knight Law School. And they had a two-year program that you'd go three nights a week. 
and I didn't know anybody and didn't have any tie-ups or commitments. So I went five nights a week and did the whole program in one year. Uh, but I got out of the Army in April. I, had a, I got a job with the General Counsel of the National Labor Relations Board doing a pellet brief. So I was writing briefs all day and then going to law school all night. It was pretty miserable the last two months. Uh, and then about uh, the early part of June, Justice Black's law clerk called me up and said, Justice Black would like to meet me. And I hadn't worked for the government long enough to have any leave, but I said I could take my lunch hour any time I wanted to. And so the law clerk came by, and he had been a student at Alabama with me, and uh, he took me out to Justice Black's home in uh, Alexandria. And we chatted for a while. Uh, my father had been a supporter of him when he ran for the Senate, and he, they had both been moved to the Knights of Pythias, so he remembered my father. And uh, after we talked for a little while, he said, uh, well, I've decided I want you to be my law clerk this year. And at the time, I didn't even know I was an applicant for being his law clerk. So just out of the blue, uh, and two weeks later, I was at the Supreme Court of the United States. He asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I was going to out, back to Alabama to practice law. And the school desegregation case was pending Brown against the board. He said, well, maybe you don't want to be my law clerk. I said, oh, yes, I want to be your law clerk. And I knew how the case was going to be decided. Anybody that read Justice Black's opinions knew how that case was going to be decided as far as his vote. And uh, then in, in May, uh, it was sort of interesting. We had a deal, the law clerks and the justices. It was really made by our predecessors that the justices would not discuss Brown against the Board of Education with their law clerks. We didn't want to be blamed for a news leak. And there were reporters all over that building every day just trying to get some inside information. And the day the case came down, I never discussed it with him. And the day the case came down, I, dr I lived with him. We had breakfast together every morning and dinner together every night. And uh, I drove his car to, and drove him to the Supreme Court building. And they met at noon in those days. And just before noon, I stuck my head in his office and said, Judge, uh, anything you need before you go on the bench today? And he said, no, everything's fine. So I think I'll go to lunch. He said, that's fine. No hint, no indication of any kind that no it was going to be an important historical day. day. But I went into Justice Jackson's law clerk's office, and his name was Barrett Prettyman, Jr. And I said, Barrett, let's go to lunch. <laughs> Barrett said, uh, I can't. My judge is here. And that was right, startling news, because Jackson had a heart attack. He'd been, been out for at least two or three weeks in the hospital. And I just said to myself, there's only one reason they would bring him from the hospital. They're going to hand down Brown today. And I ran downstairs, well, not ran, but walked fast downstairs, because the law clerks had a dining room where they went through the public cafeteria line, but had a place to eat that was private. I said, let's go upstairs. They brought Jackson from the hospital. They're going to hand down Brown. And uh, several of the clerks said, oh, my judge would have given me a hint. Uh, I've got an appointment. I've got this, that, that. And only six of us went upstairs to hear Warren Reed Brown against the Board of Education. And <laughs> it's sort of interesting because uh, I was looking up and down the bench as to who's going to dissent. I mean, this is such a controversial case. Surely, you know, I would expect a dissent. And I looked in the face of every one of those justices, Justice Clark, Justice Minton, Justice Reed, Justice Burton, uh, William Douglas. I didn't expect him to say I looked at Frankfurter. I thought he might. And then I looked in uh, Justice Wright, and I couldn't read anything in their faces. And about two-thirds through, well before the end of the opinion, the decision is announced. And Warren read, he said that, we therefore hold that segregation by race in public schools violates the 14th Amendment. But when he read it, he added the word. He said, we therefore unanimously hold. And everybody in the room relaxed. And I saw the chief in the hall that evening, and 
I said to him, I said, Chief, when you read that opinion today, you didn't read it like you wrote it. And the big Swedish face clouded up. He said, what do you mean? I said, you added the word unanimously. He said, well, I thought it was getting kind of tense in there about that time. And I've told it, I said, I've told that story many times. But somebody recently written a biography of Strom Thurmond. And I think the chapter was about how Strom Thurmond now has black people on his staff. Uh, and I think it was it somehow, but anyway, that story about me meeting the Chief Justice is in Strom Thurmond's biography, which I thought was sort of interesting. 